Most bankers aren't ready to help you until after their third cup of coffee. But with Central National Bank's after-hours service, you don't have to wait for the bank lobby to open to get help. You can contact us from 6 to 8.30 in the morning or from 5 to 10 in the evening, and we'll connect you to a real, live, local person who can answer questions and fix problems seven days a week. Bank different. Bank central. Central National Bank. Member FDIC. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. Welcome to the Blazer's Edge podcast. I'm Tara and this is Joe. Hi. Hi. We are the fanalists, and we are here to open our hearts and spill our guts and talk about everything we love about the Portland Trailblazers and the NBA. Joe, we are a couple weeks away from the end of the Blazers season. Their playoff run is over. How are you feeling? (laughs) Wow, don't hold back. (laughs) Um, I mean, obviously it was disappointing. I definitely did not think that the Blazers were going to upset and take that series, but I did not at all expect um, to be swept. I thought for sure that we would get one, maybe two, and put up a better fight. Um, You know, it just was disappointing. But I'm glad we made it there. I'm glad we made that playoff push and – kind of showed the fan base and the team, I should say, showed the fan base and everyone who loves that team just how much they were willing to fight for it and how much they wanted to succeed for us. And so I think that's always, in my opinion, the better option is to make it into the playoffs. So no matter what happened once we once we got there, I'm just glad that we were there. So I know that you have been traveling um, up to Alaska where you are right now. Did you get a chance to catch any of the Blazer games or did you have to like follow up on them after they were over? No, I, I strategically every year plot my course so that I'm able to watch the games. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I got to watch them. Um, sometimes they were in bars with a bunch of, <clears throat> excuse me, with a bunch of friends that I hadn't seen over the winter. And, uh, so I was a little distracted, but for the most part I did watch and I just, I, I mean, it, what do you do? Right? Like we can't keep up with their defense and we weren't playing, I think to our level of offense. And so combine those two things and clearly you're going to lose a series miserably. So, and it sucked and it sucked not having Nurkic, obviously, you know, his brief little debut in, uh, the third game was, it was pretty good, actually. Like he put he put up a um, some decent numbers for the amount of time that he played. But when you don't have someone that important to your team in the mix in the playoffs, obviously the Golden State Warriors are going to kick it into a higher gear too. And we needed him, and it just sucked that we couldn't have him. I'm just hoping it's not anything long term or serious. Yeah, I had um, a couple. I was I, I can't decide how I feel about them having trotted him out there for one game because I just, when, when he was being interviewed and he was saying it was up to me, whether I was going to play, I was like, "Mm, that doesn't feel right to me. I feel like it was, I don't, and I don't know what's going on behind the scenes in the medical, but just like playing with my heart like that, you know, saying that our center is okay to play. If as long as he says it's okay to play, I was just like, Oh golly been here done that I hope everything turns out okay and I'm I hope that he didn't you know make anything worse I mean obviously I don't think they would have let him play if there was any way it was going to make things worse but it was probably just a matter of how much pain can you handle so I guess you know I'll you know the flip side is wow that was amazing of him to undergo that much pain just to try it out and just to try to uh, you know get the team uh, ready and give him a little bit of a, a give, give him a little bit of a boost, but you know honestly, 
a couple uh, one thing that I was very proud of about that series is that I only said the name of that team twice, slipped up in four games. <laughs> I only slipped up and said their name twice. But also <laughs> nice. after watching the second game the the first game I was like whoa that was impressive you know maybe we can maybe we can stick with them but after watching the second game I was just like this team is just so good and I just want I just kind of sat back and enjoyed watching the ball movement and just sort of took it in for what it was but as far as the Blazers go I think it was really important that they made the playoffs um I would call their playoff run important for Partly because I think it sort of made a statement to the fans, like you were saying, that the the players were willing to go. But it also made a statement to the fans that uh, a 41-team win is not our threshold for tanking. I mean, I think it was like I, – I, I believe that the – organization was probably thinking about, okay, where are we going to go? How are we going to do this? And I think what they showed us by doing this final push was the whole organization was like, no, it has to be a lot worse than this before yeah. we're going to blow everything up. And I mean, and that, that was the message that I took away from it. It was that we're, you know, we're not going to blow everything up at this point. And for me as a fan, I'm just, I feel more comfort knowing the fact that, that it, I don't know, maybe maybe people who don't like losing <laughs> and I know there are out there, you know, are, don't appreciate that. But I appreciate the fact knowing that like a 41 team or a just under 500 team was not the threshold. Like they were going to have to come out and like totally stink it up. Like they were ready to give them that slow start and give them that chance to work their way out of it. Does that make sense? It does. And I think you're probably right. Yeah. I mean, I'm. You nailed it. Good job. <laughs> Hot take. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about next year. Let's go ahead and look to the future. I think that uh, this past year has been talked about in a hundred different ways, and um, so let's turn our eye to the future. And you know, we don't really know exactly who's going to be here next year. We figured the roster isn't going to be exactly the same. We know at least one player is not going to be returning. That's Festus Azuli. But for all mm -hmm. the rest of the players, let's talk about what we are. Let, let's do a wish list for all the rest of the players. Okay. Um, let's see. That, do you think that we might can take a while? <laughs> I know. Well, we'll have to be super disciplined. Okay. We'll, we'll see how disciplined we can be. Um, I'll, I'll have, I'll have some um, some to input, but I'm not sure I'll have something for everyone. Well, I'll let you I'll let you pick up the slack. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Well, why don't, why don't you start? Uh, what order do you want to go in? Um, I don't know. Let's just let's keep it random. I, actually, you know what? I'll start with Nurkic because I already was talking about him a little bit. Okay. Um, so what's your wish list so for Nurkic? It, the thing that I would really like for Nurkic is um, I hope that he by the time we hit the next season is fully integrated into the program that Stotts is running and he knows the ins and outs of the team, the offensive flow, and he is able to keep contributing defensively because he was not with us for long and he was already so significant. I was actually reading something just this morning about uh, how over the span of 20 games that he was in our rotation we had the 12th best defense over that 20 games and we're, we're all used to being down at the bottom. You know, we had gotten as um, low as the 26th spot, I think. And so for him to be, have such a major impact in such a short amount of time, I think that's really important. So imagine how great it will be once he is fully up to speed and he knows everything that there is to know about this this team and this program and what Stotts is doing and his teammates. So that's my wish list for him. So do you think that means for him spending the summer, you know, finishing memorizing the playbook and understanding, you know, what this team has already uh, put together? Or do you think it's kind of focused on him understanding the play and how everybody plays, watching lots of film? It's. I think it's a. Lo it's going to be a lot of everything. It's going to be practicing with the guys I'm sure he'll have some time at summer league you know as long as his leg is okay but you know it's it's not just off the court and memorizing plays and watching film and stuff it's playing more with the guys and 
feeling more comfortable. I mean, he clearly looks comfortable. He clearly looks like he's he fits in perfectly. And I love that he's around. And I think he is a great fit for our team. But I think that there are just those small things that come with playing with a team for a year or two and just being able to completely read each other and know every move, um, every all of your teammates, every moves, you know, so... I'm not speaking very well right now. <laughs> I get it. I get it. No, no, no. I mean, mostly it's keep doing what he's doing and just get locked into it. Yes. And not locked when, in. That's right. a good way to put it. And and what I what to piggyback on what you were saying, that was kind of partially my list for him was that he uh, sticks with what he knows right now that, um, that he fully integrate himself before he starts adding a bunch of things to the game. Cause you know, a lot of players go away and they add new things to the game every year. And I like understand like adding new skills, you know, and stuff like that. But as far as new strategies and, uh, new plays, I want, uh, I'd like to see them start off next year, you know, with the same basic set that was working for them before for Nurkic without trying a bunch of really tricky stuff right off the bat. I want them to get used to each other again and really, really know each other. And then the other thing with him is I think like his basketball skills are no problem, but I'd like to see some maturity. I mean, he's super young, right? I mean, he's 22 years old, so he is really young. Um, And I, I would like to see him just like, Little things like, you know, um, I, I I know it's it's funny when he, you know, photo bombs all of the um, uh, what's it called? All of the walk off interviews that everybody's doing and he's clowning around and he's, you know, having a really great time on the bench. And I love that energy that he brings. But I think it's also time a little bit for him to think about everybody else on the team and like maybe if Noah's going to have an awesome game maybe don't like go photobomb him and take the attention off of him while he's being you know getting his walk-off interview Mm -hmm. just little things like that that come with experience so I and I think so that'll be easy for for him to attain yeah so I mean I think we have very similar wish wishes for him then we kind of all flows together um, how about, you want to stick with the bigs? Sure. Let's go, let's go for Myers. You want to okay. go first? Did you say I should go first? I, I asked if you wanted to. <laughs> oh, um, sure. I'll start with Myers. Um, that's a tough one. There's been a lot of talk about whether or not Myers is going to be here next year. And, um, in terms of wish lists, I want what is best for him. And I've started to think that maybe what is best for him is a change of scenery. And I, cause I still think that he can be a, uh, a successful NBA player, but I'm not sure that uh, Portland is the right place for him, especially as exemplified by his last shot, basically getting booed in the Moda center. So I didn't like that. I, you know, I, I understand that people get frustrated, but I also understand that sometimes a change of scenery is what somebody needs. <laughs> so I guess kind of my, I don't want to wa- watch him walk away and I'm still totally convinced that someday we're going to be playing against him and he's going to be coming off of somebody's bench and scoring 20 against us. And we're just going to be like, Oh, Myers. Um, but in some ways I think in order for him to really fully realize himself, uh, he might need to do it in a different system. Yeah, I my wish list item for him is exactly the same. I want him to find a team that works for him. And we have other players that we need to focus on, you know, like Nurkic and Ed and Noah. And it's just, it's not like his contract is that hefty or anything. It's not like he's killing us um, or, you know, we're paying him dame size numbers <laughs> for for what we're getting from him. But I just don't see the point in keeping him like, yeah, it's not detrimental to keep him, but it's not really helping us either. And I, that to me is sad for him. I want him as a player to find a rotation that works for him, find a place where he's happy and he see him excel like because he's just not doing it here. And to be honest, I, I had this discussion with my friend, Ben. I don't know if that's in the NBA, like maybe it's a team overseas somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually had a technical thing for him if if he does stay. Um, I was looking at 
some of his stats for for the year. And my other wish list for him would be more shots from the right corner <laughs> 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 to to get really specific. Because so I was looking at his his shot chart and above the break. He is shooting, he shot 62 for 185 for the season. So that's like 33 and a half percent. So not great, not terrible. Um, yeah. We would certainly like him to be better than that. And we know that he shot the three better than that. But um, so 62 of 185. So he shot 27 times from the corners. And from the left, he was four of 13. But from the right, he was 8 of 14. He was shooting 57% from the oh, right wow. corner. I know. So I thought, You should not? send him that information. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I don't understand yet, like, why, if it's just because of there's not as much space in the right corner, why we don't get more, why we don't uh, take more shots generally as a team from the corners. But I think I would love to see some plays being more plays run for Myers in that right corner. Um, so that's my other uh, desire for Myers. Well, we'll see what happens. I don't think anyone's going to be surprised if he goes. Um, I, I, at this point would be surprised if he stayed, but then again, we're not the boss, right? I just <laughs> so. never know what this team is going to do. <laughs> yeah. Who do you want to do next? Let's see. Well, let's to go, let's go to Ed, I guess. Cause he's our other, uh, uh, closest thing, uh, you know, the next closest to center, Ed and uh, Noah kind of are, you know, center slash power forwards. I didn't really put a lot of thought into Ed. My only idea for him was I wanted his health. Um, I wanted him to come back healthy and, and happy and ready to go. So how about you do Ed and I'll do Noah? I mean, obviously you can chime in with Noah if you want, but. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of the same way because it was, it was such a strange year for Ed Davis because, like, we kept – I remember talking about the team earlier in the season. We'd sort of forget about Ed, Ed Davis, and we all had to remind ourselves that Ed Davis was there. <laughs> yeah. And, and then he got injured, and he actually wasn't there. <laughs> so, I mean, I think next year just having him back in the lineup is, like, my number one wish is to have him – a part of the rotation and I really missed his aggressive rebounding. I used to love watching him go for those rebounds. And I just, you know, really, even when he was playing last year, he didn't seem to be as, um, as focused on or as, as tuned into that as he had been the year before. And maybe it was just a matter of them all trying to get used to playing again. Um, but I would like to see him go back to his former rebounding um, form. Cause I think that was one of the things that was really tough on us, especially in the first part of the year. And I'm really looking forward to seeing him play beside Nurkic. Oh, really? that's funny. Cause I really like watching Noah play beside Nurkic. I do too, but I'm, I'm anxious to see, how Ed will look. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when Ed was, when Ed came to us, he was shooting like 60%, right. From within three feet. And that's just, I mean, yeah, we need that. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm wondering, it's been so long since I've seen Ed Davis play. I'm trying to recall like what different things do Ed Davis and Noah Vonley bring to the table? Can you think of off the top of your head, some of the different uh, strengths that each of those guys brings? Um, I think, well, Noah's still developing, right? Like he's still, he's still got some, some time before he comes, becomes the player that he will eventually be. But I think, I think Noah is a little more versatile. I think he's, once he gets there, that we can use him. I think he'll have more range. Um, He's so, they're both strong underneath the basket, but I think Noah is just like, he's like a wall. And once he, once he develops, right, I think he'll just in general be way more versatile than Ed. I think Ed's going to be kind of like the old traditional big man and and I I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Sure and you know maybe it'll it'll be more of have a little bit more of a, a rebounding and defensive focus while we kind of explore the offensive potential of Noah Vonley. You know his ability last year to get all of those offensive rebounds and get all those putbacks um you know so maybe we we throw in Ed when we need more uh, lockdown uh, presence and more more defensive, and we can uh, play Noah when we have a little bit more freedom to try and score. Yeah, there's a big age difference between them. Ed Davis is 27, and Noah Vonley's only 21. Dude, Noah is 
He's I, so my, young. My wish for him, so I'll I'll go on my wish list item for him, um, is I want him to be a power couple with Nurkic. <laughs> I, I I want that to happen. I I really like him. At, it, you know, like when I say power couple in this scenario, I mean like like Tim Duncan and David Robinson were. You know, like I like just a wall okay and if you put Nurkic who obviously helps us defensively and he develops a little bit more and becomes more comfortable and more sure of himself then I think the two of them can have a really powerful defensive impact so Nurkic at at the five and Noah at the four um I just think it'll be a really flexible versatile difficult to stop sort of line up with those those two next to each other. So that's what I want. I want them to be a power couple. <laughs> well, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, they certainly showed a, a tremendous amount of potential in the short time that they were together. And one of the things that I've talked about before about uh, Noah this year is that as soon as like, you know, there was, there was some slow and steady improvement, but as soon as, soon as Nurkic got here, he just, his um, learning curve just went um, just went way up. He just seemed to like absorb a whole bunch a lot faster. And um, so what I'm looking for for Noah, and this is kind of a, a tandem wish for both Noah and Damian Lillard, actually, I would like Noah Vonley to get a power forward mentor, a veteran, somebody who doesn't play very much, maybe even somebody like Chris Kamen, like somebody who's been around like, seen a ton of time in the playoffs who knows everybody and who can sit next to Noah and can talk to Noah about, okay, you see what he did to you right there? Here's how I handled it. And so he can just be in his ear sitting on the bench with Noah, telling him exactly what to do and how to handle specific people. Cause like I said, Noah's a sponge. I mean, he loves playing. He loves learning. He picks things up quickly, and if he had some older player who's been around a really long time to just download all their information, I mean, what if we, I mean, this isn't going to happen, but what if he had somebody like Kevin Garnett sitting next to him, (laughs) you know, saying, this is how I handle Blake Griffin, this is how I handle this guy, this is how I handle this guy. I have... I have often wanted Kevin Garnett to just be my like life buddy and walk yeah. around and tell me how to live my life. He seems like he seems like he would be great. So I'm sure I am sure Noah would be on board with that plan. <laughs> that would be that would be really rad, actually. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure the team has guys like that. But it, you, you're right. When it was Chris Kamen and he was actually on the roster, it was just built in all the time, always there. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure they have the right people in place and, and the big man coaches and stuff like that. He's he's just he's at a crossroads because he he took a pretty significant jump after the all star break. Right. And I think it had something to do with this text message that Damian Lillard sent as well. Right. I was reading something about that. Um, and so if he keeps if he keeps jumping like that, if he keeps progressing like that. Um, I think he's going to be so great. He's, this is, like I said before, it's the first time I really feel like I've not, I was over the Vonley experiment. Remember You've been saying that for like I was two years so <laughs> over it. I was so over it, but this, the last little bit of the season, um, this time around, it's the very first time that I've looked at him and thought he looks comfortable. He looks aware and we had that conversation about that that one play, the, the buzzer beater that he had, where he was aware enough to be like, well, Myers, you just messed it up. Let me let me take it for you. Like, let me do it. Um, and so I think he's, yeah, more comfortable, more aware. He's looking way better on offense and also, you know, decent on defense. And I just think he's going to continue to perfect those things and then there'll be the power couple that I want them to be. Well, I think Noah's got, I think he's got everything in, in place to, you know, over the next, you know, two years develop into something really special that we're going to be really glad that we had. And the reason I said that this was kind of a double wish for Noah Vonley and for Damian Lillard is because I'm going to just jump to Damian Lillard. Is that okay? 
Yeah, I know it's kind of like going from the power forwards to the point guard, but we can switch back. But one of the reasons I want a, an older veteran to come in for Noah Vonley is, and I have to say this in a way that I want to make sure I, 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 I do, it, it isn't misconstrued. I think they need to have um, a, a veteran to give a different type of leadership than – that Damian Lillard is giving. I think Damian Lillard has done a fantastic job as a leader and a mentor for this team. But even the, you know, even superstars need a mentor themselves. They need somebody that they can talk to. And if he had one of these longtime veterans in the locker room when he needs to, you know, let off a little steam or if he needs to let a little pressure off of himself to have somebody who's been there to talk to, I don't think that takes anything away from Damian's leadership abilities himself. But I think it would enhance his ability, actually, to be a good leader for the rest of the team. Does that make any sense at all? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I want this, so this magical power forward mentor who's going to come in and help Noah Vonley is also going to be there to help Damian. Do you have Kevin Garnett's number? <laughs> <laughs> I could give him I could give him a call. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know. I mean, one of the people that I'm thinking about who kind of fits this bill, but not really, because I think he's still a little bit immature would be like Blake Griffin. I mean, I love I love Blake Griffin. I mean, I he has him. I don't know that he would provide enough of the, you know, um, what Damien needs, but I think he would certainly provide what uh, Vonley needs. And I have no idea whether it would work out because he is a free agent and I have no idea how we would go out and get one of those. So I'm just going to drop it right there. But, <laughs> well, but anyway. the, Clippers, the Clippers are probably going to blow it all up anyway, so. I can't you wait know, to see what happens with there's the Clippers. A chance. <laughs> I can't wait yeah, to see what happens. I but mean, we've I was like, all been wait, waiting and watching for years to see when the Clippers were going to blow it all up and start again, and they just they haven't. So I think I know they just keep hanging in there. I think this time around they might do it. <laughs> it might actually happen. Yeah, this time I had it all worked out in my head where there was going to be a sign and trade, and there was going to be a package, and there was going to all this stuff. And then I was like, when's the last time the NBA had a sign and trade? I have no idea. It seems like. I haven't heard about one for ages. So, so anyway, I went, that was my Damien Lillard wish. Do you have okay. a wish for Damien? I do. I actually, I comboed Damien and CJ together um, because just like I wanted, I'm starting to realize that a lot of my wish list items are revolving completely around Nurkic. <laughs> um, I want, like, I want him to have a power couple with Noah Vonley. I also want the three of them, Dame, CJ, and Nurkic, to have a really good rhythm together. So that was my wish list item for Dame and CJ. It's just keep up that rhythm with Nurkic. I like the three of them together, and if they can keep it up, like, if Dame and CJ are are incredible with assists and if they can keep feeding him down low it's dynamite i think it's going to be so fun to watch and i think they've already fallen into a groove and a gel together and so i just want that to continue and for that rhythm feel the rhythm feel the rhyme so if those three are clicking together like so well and everything uh what happens to the other two people on the on the floor at the same time do they just like play defense (laughs) 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 I mean it's going to depend on the team and the play and what's going on of course but you know if you've got Dame and CJ and Nurkic all clicking and then you've got Noah and Nurkic clicking on the other end of the floor on defense I, I think you're just starting to look at a really nice lineup yeah no I think having You know, if I'm still like not ready to say, you know, after 20 games that Nurkic is everything that he showed us, but I'm feeling much more confident than um, I did, you know, at the, you know, at the all-star break, right? Um, Because, yeah, just having Damon CJ, I think they need another, they need another outlet and I just, but they need it, they need a scorer. And I don't know if Nurkic is going to be that scorer or if he's going to be facilitating the scoring for somebody else. Yeah, but that's part of having the whole trio. Like, as long as Lillard and McCollum are running offense, then, you know, you are you really don't have a whole lot of scoring problems, right? Like, you're talking about people that these two combined to average, like, what was it? 
50, like around 50, 50 points a game. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you still got to score 50 more <laughs> between everybody else. But now you're talking about if they can also feed him down low and he can get a little offense there. And then he and Noah are the wall on the other side. That's the whole point. Like it's like, I don't know if he needs to be a 20 points per game kind of guy. Um, I just, I, I think he's, I, th- I'm very optimistic about him. Now I was very optimistic about, Festus Azili, I was like, yeah, like, I want him to heal up and come back and play for the Blazers, and obviously I was completely wrong about that. I was also totally wrong when I said I thought the Blazers could win 50 games, so so I'm, I'm often wrong. I'm just saying I really, I'm not so concerned about the level of offense that he brings because I think that that will, I think it'll ride a line that works just fine for us. And I'm just really wanting him to continue to click well on the defense. And, um, yeah, anyway. Well, and people have been talking about like, even, even if he's not scoring, people have been talking about how Nurkic, you know, just makes things easier for everybody because his size demands attention from the other team. And that just gives that many, you know, a few more inches to everybody else on, in which they can operate. So, um, yeah, I, I see, I think we, we circled back to Nurkic again when I, I was really tra- talking about Damon CJ. You just but... really want to talk about Nurkic, but I, I, haven't, know, I haven't said my wish list for CJ yet. Okay, and what is it? I really had a hard time coming up because I think CJ had such a great year and he really just grew into the player that he had already always been completely confident that he was. And we finally just like all got on board. Um, so I think CJ actually needs his own podcast. That's what I want for CJ. Uh, he, he's next qualified. Year. I know. Well, he is all over the place. Like this summer is like the summer of CJ goes like on tour or whatever. He's absolutely everywhere. He's showing. I know that you haven't had a lot of time because you're getting your season started up in Alaska. He's been on like every between halftime at every game. I swear he's all over the place. And I, I just selfishly would like him to have his own podcast so that he can come back home and stop like going all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being like a mother hen in that regard. Like I just want him to be home where he can just pay attention to his own team and, you know, stick close to home. Like every time he travels somewhere, you don't know if he's going to, you know, run into some kind of, you know, trouble that he couldn't control or if he's going to like fall in love with some other community. Like suddenly he's like, I want to be in New York. Like, no, we want you here in Portland. So no, I want him to get you his think own. he would walk away from Damien? No, I really don't think so. But you know what? The more he gets out in the world, oh, I just think if we, no, if he had his I... own show, everybody could come to him. I think I think maybe one day CJ will want to walk away from Damien because he'll want to be the star and he'll want the limelight on him. And that just I mean, yes, Rib City loves him. And yes, he is so valuable to us. And the, the fan base knows it. The franchise knows it. The whole league knows it. I don't think that he's not getting any love, but he will never, ever top Damien Lillard. Mm-hmm. You think as, as long as they're together? No, I I. Yeah, I think as long as they're together, Damien's always the face. And so at some point, I think CJ might say, I want to go be the star somewhere. I just don't think that's yet. I don't think he's ready to leave Damien yet. I think that um, I think it's a question we need to keep ourselves honest and keep asking whether or not CJ is someday going to eclipse Damian Lillard. And we have to probably figure out, like, what are we talking about by eclipse? <laughs> like, do we mean like better statistics? Do we mean like more money? Like, what do we mean by better? Like right now, I still would put I still would keep Damian um, if I had to choose. Um, but I think we need to continue because as CJ continues to show how smart he is, what a good player he is, that guy can sh- shoot from anywhere and do anything except for that last game of the playoffs. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. That was the craziest thing. He got like well, what, he got, like six points in the last game or something crazy like that. I don't know. Not a lot went well for us in those no. playoffs. <laughs> I mean, no. there, were, there were nice – there were a few times where it looked like they were going to keep up, but – not yeah. a whole lot. It so. was that was that was just yeah. Oh, we well, keep coming if, back to that. If, if we're um, if we're sticking to our guards here, then maybe we should talk about Alan Crap. Sure. Yeah. What's your wish list for Alan? Um, my wish. You know, I am the president of the Alan Crap fan so club. So they say. <laughs> 
Um, my wish for him is I want him to get his spot back. I want him to earn his spot back because he disappointed a lot of people this year. He, I looked it up. He played 149 more minutes this season than last season, but it doesn't seem like that many more. I I know over 82 I'm, games. That's like not even two extra minutes a game. I, that's not my point. My point is like you, you pick, I don't care if it's one minute or a thousand, you played more minutes, you got paid a hell of a lot more, but there's just not much to show for it. And he also took less shots and his rebounds were down. So, you know, we're at this, this cusp with crab where everyone's like, we have salary cap problems. We need to offload him. And I'm like, who's going to, who, who's going to take that contract with that kind of production. Right. So he needs to, he needs to step it up and i want him i want him to earn his spot back with the team so my i had a similar thing written down for alan crab for alan crab i had more shots with it, two exclamation points <laughs> and um i as far as i could tell and this was just an eye test thing but as far as i could tell he was getting the ball but he was hesitating and to me like that was our undoing in the uh playoffs not that we had you know a big chance but like you said like you thought we could win a game i thought that we could have done better if we hadn't hesitated but by the end by that fourth game Every single person, even Damian Lillard, was hesitating. But it's something that I've seen for a long time with Allen where he, you know, he's really great at catch and shoot. But when he gets slightly off, slightly less confident, he'll end up taking a couple dribbles and passing it. Or he'll, um, he he just won't like, no, Allen, catch and shoot. That's you. That's what you're super good at. I mean, and he really is because his shooting um, percentages were still good. He just wouldn't take the shots. <laughs> so yeah, take those we, shots, talked, Alan. we talked about that a couple of seasons ago. I think when we were first getting started about how much, how much quicker his release was and how much more successful he was. So I think that's what you're saying, right? You don't want him to hesitate. You don't want, want him to get in there and, and just be confident and take those shots. So do you think he can do it? Or do you think at this point it's like, Yes, I th- I think that he can. I think it's just a, you know, um, actually one of the other things I'd like for him, and maybe this would uh, result in more shots possibly, I'd like to see him playing with the starters. Um, I'd like to well, see him he's start. Got to earn that spot. Well, but I mean, does he really? Because honestly, I mean, look at what we've been doing the last couple of years. It, have the starters necessarily been the fe- the five best guys on the team? You know, I mean, I think I think Terry Stotts plays the five guys that he thinks are going to get us going the fastest. And most of them are the best players on the team. But sometimes he puts in, you know, like he was saying that, you know, he thought Noah just needed the practice or he just needed the experience. So, you know, I think I want to see I want to see Crab get an extended run as a starter and see how that goes. Yeah, see if you can string something together. I'll let Terry Stotts know. I'll shoot him an email. Okay. Also, tell him I still am waiting on that glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, let's see. Did we? Did you say what your wish for Damien was? Was it all wrapped up in the? It was the, yeah. The it was all wrapped up. But can I throw you a curveball here because you brought up Terry Stotts? I have a wish list item for Terry Stotts. Um, I do not want him to feel the pressure. I feel like a lot of people are viewing this upcoming season as sort of a make or break or like a big move needs to be made or, you know, do something with your backcourt, um, split up Damien and CJ, or what are you going to do about all your injured bigs and things like that. And I, I, and you know, obviously there's the age old defensive discussion, right? Um, amp up the defense. I think Terry is on amazing coach I think he's great at fundamentals and I just hope he gets the space to do what he does and to do it to the best of his abilities without all the pressure so your wish for him is to be able to tune out all of the extra chatter focus on the team keep doing what he's doing yeah and I strongly believe that a nice glass of wine would help relax him and we could just talk shop man (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, that seems like a that's that's a good one. That's a good one for him. You know, it's tough when you're in a small market. I I imagine everything is just that much more intense when things are not going the way everybody expect them. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess what I would say is that um, for like. I can't. I don't really have a wish list for Terry, but one for me is that I consciously reset my expectations again at the beginning of next year. Um, oh yeah, because you know the beginning of last year I didn't have like crazy high expectations. I thought we were going to win forty five, which we did not achieve. Um, but I just, I just considered everything was going to go on the same trajectory, which I think a lot of people did. Um, but when I saw that it wasn't, I adjusted my expectations. But I think a lot of people sometimes don't want to let go of their original expectations and they just think like like you know despite the fact that when you looked at them they weren't putting it together the way they were they still thought but we can still get there we can still get there so i want to just be realistic with expectations and i think that makes it easier um you know for the the rest of the community if we aren't if we don't load up with um expectations that are not realistic well, we are not called fanatics for, for nothing, nothing, right? <laughs> so who knows That's if that sure. will happen, but... <laughs> I have another guard I want to talk about. Okay, who? M- my buddy Shabazz. I like Shabazz so much as a player. I didn't do one player. for him. Yeah, I like him too. I didn't, now I'm feeling bad I didn't do one for him. Well, my one for him is super simple, playing time. I mean, but he has shown... And I guess... I guess Tim, I don't know why I feel differently about Shabazz than I did, did about Tim Frazier. Maybe they're very similar. And maybe Shabazz is somebody else who just needs to go somewhere else and get a chance. And once he's given that chance, he can, you know, play, get the minutes that he needs. I just really like Shabazz. I think he's um, a clutch player. He's, um, you know, comes in like all poise, ready to go every single time, no matter when he gets pulled in. And uh, I just really like him and I just want to see him play more. I feel like he's always has an air of confidence. Like maybe he's not confident in what he's doing, but he pulls it off and it makes, he makes it look like he is. I think he is confident. I think two national championships makes you pretty confident. Yeah, that's (laughs) true. I just, I think, I think he is confident, but he just hasn't, you know, gotten a lot of playing time and that's just kind of how our rotations go. So there's my other perennial request of Terry Stotts. My perennial wish is a true backup point guard. Well, I'm sure he's going to get some more playing time because he definitely had proved himself a little. Well, who do you want to talk about next? Um, how about Aminu? Oh, Al Farouk. You're not going to be surprised by my wish list item. <laughs> what is yours? I want him to get some handles. Oh, you want him to? You don't want him to just never dribble the ball again? I want him to dribble well. I want him to have some ball handling skills. <laughs> well, I think that's important because I think some people would have said, some people are saying just don't let him dribble at all. Well, that's, I was saying that when it was like in season and I, he didn't have time to perfect it, but now he's got a summer to get some practice in, maybe work with somebody. I don't know, but it is like cringeworthy to me the way he handles the ball. I don't like, he's got versatility for sure. And I, I mean, there are others that I'd like his shooting to improve to back to somewhat consistent and stuff like that. But I mean, just learn how to dribble, man. <laughs> He'll, he can spend the uh, the summer doing the chair drills where you like go yeah. put like twelve chairs out and dribble just between them all summer long. Yep. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm actually I'm surprised that you said that because I thought you were going to say that you wanted him to not ever dribble again. <laughs> no, I mean that's just not realistic. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, well, you know how much I love Aminu, and you know that I'm probably the only person in Portland who cheers him on when he has a fast break. Um, but I did try to, you know, give a critical eye uh, to, you know, not not let my um, enjoyment of him uh, cloud my uh, judgment. Um, so I think he needs to practice dribbling in a straight line because <laughs> I think what well I think what usually happens and when he ends up. Um, uh, you know, messing up the ball or losing the ball is when he's like 
going to side to side or when he's like because sometimes he's going like from one side of the court to the other side of the court and then back again and it's like whoa like i think he needs needs to practice going straight line straight to the hoop and just keep it super traditional go to the hoop and either you know shoot it or kick it out and just like concentrate on sort of narrowing his um narrowing his focus i guess yeah um so even if he wants yeah so you know, you know me. I um, I enjoy a good Alpha Rukamini fast break, and I just you hope like it will be straight chaos. to the <laughs> straight to the basket. <laughs> My goodness, I don't I don't even want to talk about Amino anymore. <laughs> <laughs> How about Mo? Yeah, I just mine for him is super simple, and it's just to keep on keeping on, like just keep up on that upward climb. I'd like to see him um, score more for sure. Um, but I think Mo is doing – I think he's doing all the right things, and I think he's fine. Yeah. So for me – And he still has beautiful teeth. He sure does. <laughs> um, for me, I actually – when I was thinking about Maurice Harkless, I came up with the hashtag that I'm going to pr- promote next year. Um, next year, the big hashtag – for blazer basketball is going to be hashtag mo dunks because i want mo dunks <laughs> i love watching him dunk and he was actually second behind Plumley in terms of dunking you know the way he slashes to the basket he i mean i actually sat there and watched uh, not all 68 of his dunks but a whole bunch of them and i mean i guess let's face it. I like offense. I know you love defense, but offense is like what I pay attention to. And I love that. I'm totally fall for like, you know, the cheap excitement of a <laughs> big dunk. And so Mo's my guy. So hashtag Mo dunks is going to be um, what I'm going to push next year. Um, but the other thing that I think um, I could really see him improving next year and it kind of it reminded me of uh, a way that CJ improved throughout the year. Throughout the year, and Dan actually Dan Morang actually pointed this out to me in a way that I hadn't really thought about it. That um, by the time we got to the the playoffs, you could tell that CJ really really studied the scouting reports because CJ was. Um, uh, he w- he knew exactly what his player that he was guarding was going to do, which is part of the reason that CJ's uh, defense was so good in the playoffs. Everyone was like, whoa, where did this come from? And part of it is because he had time to prepare, and he did a really good job for the most part um, just anticipating like what Clay was going to do. And I think Mo, with his giant long arms and his quickness, if he were to study the scouting reports like CJ did and apply that, I think he could really take a um, – I think he could really take a big step on defense. So scouting reports and hashtag Mo Dunks. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna, I will help you promote that that hashtag i like it i think it's very creative because you can use hashtags on instagram too (laughs) yes yes not not just on twitter (laughs) um do you did you have one for evan turner i didn't because i you know i don't judge evan turner (laughs) no i didn't i don't have one for him Um, okay i have i do have one for him okay you go it kind of goes along the line with Mo and hashtag Mo Dunks. I think Evan Turner could be our alley oop assist uh, specialist. So I <laughs> want some more alley oop assists from Evan Turner. Goes along with my love of offense. Um, Are you, do you have a creative hashtag for that? No, I wasn't as inspired. It doesn't mean I won't have one by the time by the start of the next season. I got a, I got a few months. Um, okay, but that's my wish for Evan Turner is that he gets more alley oop assists. All right. Um, I think we, we're getting a little close on time. So I'd like to do a couple generals, like one about okay. Neil Olshay and one about the team. Ooh, do you want to sure. sh- shift that direction before we wrap up? I have just, can I do super quick ones for, uh, Pat Connerton and Jake Lehman? Yeah, go for it. Um, I want, uh, let's see. I want uh, Jake Lehman to have a killer summer league um, because I think Pat Connaughton had a really nice summer league and that gave him a lot of confidence. So I would like Jake Lehman to have a really great uh, summer league. So even if he doesn't see the court a whole bunch, he will have the confidence that he had a really good summer league and he learned a lot and he can just that can kind of keep him going as he's going throughout the year if he doesn't see a lot of court time. Okay. And then. 
So for for Pat Connaughton, I'd like to see some more experimentation about just like what position does he play? <laughs> I would like to get a little bit more more clarity um, because he played a uh, point guard. He played mostly shooting guard, but he also played a little more point guard last year. He played a little over. He played like eleven percent of his time position as point guard, and then four uh, percent as small forward. So I just like to do some experimentation with Pat Connaughton in the lineup and see if um, if he can be versatile. Maybe he could be one of those guys that slides around and plays different positions. Yeah, for sure. He's a little tank that one. Yeah. Although he may end up just going ahead and playing baseball after this year. So <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if he'll be around cause he still has um, the option to play baseball. I think. Oh yeah. Who was it that tried drafting him? The Orioles? Uh, the Baltimore. He's been drafted by a couple of teams, but I think the most recent one was the Orioles. Mm, okay. Um, you got no love for Quarterman? Oh, for Quarterman, I have listed muscles. <laughs> <laughs> he's a pretty little bit of a thing and i mean he's a pretty small guy and i mean he's six six and he's 190 pounds but uh if he's gonna see the court more and not get thrown all around he's gonna need some muscles i think so that's my wish for him all right that's a good one um i'm gonna shift to neil Olshay. Okay. i want neil to do something incredible with those draft picks um i think he's We've obviously got some salary cap issues. I don't think it's crazy dire, but we do. And we need, like, cheap, malleable, contributing players, you know. Um, or I guess he could pull off a really good deal. Uh, but he's got some assets that he can use. And I just – I'm wishing for him to have the clarity of mind that he usually does because he's a good GM and that he puts together something decent for us this, this off season. So do you think – do you want him to do like draft with all of those or are you saying you want him to like do something with them, whether or not it's actually draft those pieces or if it's package them up and trade them away? Yeah, he could, he could, I just want him to do something useful with those assets. And so if, whether it's in a part of a package deal or he, you know me, I don't really like, um, playing too much GM. No, I don't like, um, rookies so much mm. like they <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of a better way to put it but it's just so very rare that they come out like like Damian Lillard you know and so I they make me a little bit nervous but I think that just a little bit of bolstering needs to be done here and if we can get somebody cheap or like I said malleable and they can kind of fit in well and, and learn how to fit in well and learn our systems well then it would be great. So I trust Neil. Um, he obviously does a great job. So I don't think we have anything to worry about. I just am wishing for him to continue to d make those good choices. Mm -hmm. Well, drafting and trading is definitely, you know, of the three pillars on which building a team, you know, revolves around drafting mm -hmm. and trading are definitely his strengths. Free agency, we haven't seen um a lot of return yet but uh, two out of those three he's got a pretty good reputation with that's for sure yeah he also did uh he did gra draft blake griffin i don't know why i can't let go of that <laughs> I, I love blake <laughs> i know he's i would be blake i feel best, somehow disloyal yeah <laughs> I, I scratch that i don't want kevin garnett following me around i want blake griffin i would be laughing constantly it would be so great. <laughs> you know, I've been like uh, fascinated with Marcin Gortat in the um in the was on the Wizards during the playoffs. I've decided that I want him to be like be my bodyguard because because okay. <laughs> he has like this. I was like, I want him to follow me around and like glare at everybody that I'm mad at. And so I went online and tried to find like uh, photos of him glaring. And he actually is like a real cut up. And he's always like got all these silly pictures of him making all these funny faces. I'm like, you're supposed to be like, you know, this fierce dude, like, <laughs> rimmed, like on the feet on the court. He's like really scary. But off the court, he seems like he's like a pretty nice guy. <laughs> Yeah. So you're over the Steven Adams thing? Well, he hasn't really um, – he didn't really impress me this year like he did the year before. Like part, the year before, one of the things that was so fun about him, you were, it was like, where did he come from? Who is this? He's just like, you know, so entertaining watching and, you know, to watch. And this year he was just kind of like, where are you, Steven? Where are you? So, yeah, I don't – He's I don't know probably who. out looking for you. 
<sighs> well, he w- <laughs> didn't have his head in the game the same way that he did the year before. Or I don't know. Maybe, again, like there's that whole myth or I don't know if it's a myth. There's that whole um, debate about whether guys kind of can let down after they've signed a huge contract and he signed a huge contract. So, you know, maybe now that all of our guys are a year out of that. Mm-hmm. They can kind of put all that behind them, and I don't know. It's it's been amazing that after the year we had, people are people seem to be pretty positive, and I think a lot of it is because of Nurkic. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is because we know what we have with Damian. A lot of it is because CJ had, uh, you know, a year that he knew all along he was going to have, and that we all just finally got on board. Yeah, it's. I think Rip City is just a notoriously looking through rose colored glasses. Um I mean they they get upset and they obviously do things like boo Myers Leonard or, or And Twitter is not always the um most rosy place. Right. <laughs> but but we are so we constantly buy back into it. Constantly like, yeah, of course they're gonna win a championship this year. Duh. And so right. we just don't, we don't give up. We're resilient. I guess that's a better way to put it. Um, so do you when, have, oh, go ahead. Well, I was to say when I, I, I studied Latin in college and I studied classics and I'm not going to tell tell you the quote in Latin, but one of my favorite quotes was credulous hope supports our lives and says that tomorrow will always be better. And I that's cannot kind of, believe you remember that. That's kind of my <laughs> motto. <laughs> nice. It's a good I was one. just looking super quickly over the list of players to make sure that we didn't leave anybody out. And I don't think that we did except for Festus Azili, but we addressed that. Yeah. Well, do you have any general wish for the team? Oh, mine, mine is just the constant, constant never goes away. I wish for better defense. Yeah. Which I think we can get. I would like, I mean, I I actually would like the return of our offense that we had two years ago um, because I think it kind of disappeared and I think they're related. I think they get, I think what happened last year is they came out of the gate, they were concentrating so hard on defense and failing at it so quickly that it got in their heads and they couldn't do offense anymore either. And then that just was like the spiral that they just had to fight through, which they eventually did and it helped a lot to get. Uh, to introduce Nurkic into the mix. But I think, you know, both defense, I mean, everybody knows both defense and offense are important. Um, So my wish is going to be for hashtag Modunks and uh, the return of the 2015 offense. And I don't think we could ever ask for more than that. (laughs) (laughs) It seems like, you know, it seems like pretty reasonable, right? (laughs) We just want it all. (laughs) It's because we love them, right? Well, it is. Yes, it's because we love them. Um, it has been great catching up with you. I hope everything's going well down in the land of, of like, warmth and an actual city and good food. <laughs> yeah, we finally we finally did get a little warm-up. So uh, everybody in Portland is out sneezing now because uh, allergies have kicked in. But, yeah, it, it has been really great catching up. This has been fun to talk about uh, the future, and I'm sure we're going to come up with all kinds of other uh, things to talk about this summer because, I mean, we've got, before we know it, the playoffs will be over, the draft will be around the corner, free agency is going to come up. I mean, it's just never going to stop, right? Nope. So <laughs> let's let's remind people that uh, you can find the Blazers Edge podcast on Stitcher or iTunes, or you can go right over to BlazersEdge.com, where they will be uh, continue to create new content over the summer, where you can find out all about the what the Blazers do with the draft, where you can hear about the rumors uh, of free agency and find out how it all shakes out um, to get ready for next season. So until next time, go Blazers! Yeah!